this is going to be another question and answer video. And this question has to do with Calvinism. Can I explain how the Calvinists are in error? If Calvinism is true, and God automatically saved a certain people, and God automatically damns a certain people, then there would have been no reason for him to ever give Adam and Eve a choice in the garden, period. There would have been no need for him to give them a tree to eat off, the trees they could eat off of, and tree that, a tree that they couldn't eat off of. He could have made humans pre-programmed to never sin before they ever even sinned to begin with. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, it says, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. He gave them a choice. Why was there a choice? If God was just going to damn people and then save some people no matter what, then why not just pre-program the first ones to never sin? And why did he give them a choice? But if he would have just, you know, pre-programmed them to never sin, this way Adam never would have passed on a sinful nature to everyone else. If, the, if Adam and Eve hadn't have done what they did, Adam wouldn't have passed on his sinful nature to everyone else. So if the Lord was just going to save some here and damn some here, why not pre-program Adam to never sin? He gave them a choice. Why was there a choice? If God was going to damn some and save some no matter what, then why not just pre-program the first ones to never sin? Many preachers teach today that God chooses certain men to be saved and that God chooses certain men to not be saved. This isn't true according to the Bible. God chooses that anyone who gets in Christ is going to heaven. But it is every man's free will to choose to get in Christ or to reject Jesus Christ. In Ephesians 1, 4 and 1, 5, it says, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the ple good pleasure of his will. So God knows who is going to get in and who will choose not to get in. But you're not chosen until you get in. It says in Ephesians 1, 4, According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. 1 Peter 1, 2, Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God knows who's going to get in. He doesn't choose who's going to get in. Just because God knows who will get saved and who won't get saved doesn't mean he chose who would get saved and who wouldn't get saved. And many like to use Pharaoh as an example to prove Calvinism, because the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart. However, God already knew from his foreknowledge that Pharaoh was not going to let the people go, because before Moses even went, the Lord said in Exodus 3.19, And I am sure that the king of Egypt will not let you go, no, not by a mighty hand. While God didn't make Pharaoh choose to not let the people go, he did use Pharaoh's bad choice to show the power of God to the nations. In Romans 9, 17 through 21, it says, For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, Even for this same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he will have mercy, and on whom he will he hardeneth. Thou wilt say then unto me, Why doth, ye, why doth he yet find fault? For who hath resisted his will? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that repliest against God? Should the thing formed save to him that formed it? Why hast thou made, thee the, made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction? Pharaoh was used by God his bad choice was used by God so that God could make his power known. But he didn't make Pharaoh do what he did. But he did use his choice. God will use your choice. He'll use a bad man's choice to 
make his power known. That's what he did with Pharaoh. But with that brief introduction, let's look at the tulip that Calvinists believe. The five doctrines, the five points of Calvinism, the tulip. And let's see if it's biblical. Okay, you got the word tulip. The T stands for total depravity. Now, I wholeheartedly believe that man is sinful. He's messed up. The Bible is clear in Romans 3, 10 through 12. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. We know that man is sinful. They teach, the Calvinists teach that since a man is dead and trespasses and sins, that he can't even believe on Jesus Christ. He's so totally depraved, he can't even believe on Jesus Christ. They teach that man is so totally depraved that he couldn't seek after God on his own. And this isn't true. Consider the story in Matthew 15, 21 through 23. It says, Then Jesus went thence and departed into the coasts of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came out of the same coasts and cried unto him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, thou son of David. My daughter is grievously vexed with the devil. She's seeking him out. He didn't seek her out. Because look what it says in verse 23. But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and besought him, saying, Send her away. For she crieth after us. Jesus, the disciples, they were not seeking this woman out. She sought the Lord out. Now notice this woman was seeking Jesus on her own. Jesus wasn't seeking her. And it even says he answered her not a word. But eventually says in verse 28, Then Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith, be it unto thee even as thou wilt. Jesus Christ was not seeking her. She was seeking him, and he even said that it even said he answered her not a word, but ended up saying, Great is thy faith. She sought him out. Jesus Christ died on the cross for everyone's sins. He was buried and resurrected, and he is now presently drawing all men to him. In John 12, 32 through 33, it says, And I, and if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. This he said, signifying what death he should die. So he's drawing all men to him. Man is totally, man is totally messed up, totally depraved. He's full of sin, but he can still seek God to be saved because God is presently drawing all men to him. Notice in the Bible that God gives things freely. God lets men freely offer. In Genesis 2, 16 and 17, the verses we've already read, And the Lord God commanded the man, saying, Of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof thou shalt surely die. They can freely eat of every tree of the garden. Freely. And then... The tree of the knowledge of good and evil, they sh shouldn't eat of it, he says. He gave them two choices. They could freely eat off the good ones, but they were not supposed to eat off of another one. There was a choice. Adam and Eve made the wrong choice. Leviticus 1.3, If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will. At the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord. Not because he was making them. Not because he put a gun to their head. Not because of anything other than their own voluntary will. So that that's God putting the responsibility on man. God's done his responsibility. He died on the cross for our sins. Now it's up to us to accept the payment. And some... 119.108, except I beseech thee the free will offerings of my mouth, O Lord, and teach me thy judgments. The offerings were free will offerings. If you teach that God automatically damns some, 
Then you teach that man has to give account for something for the which he couldn't help. If man is so depraved that he can't even believe on Jesus Christ without God doing it against his will, then if a man rejects Jesus Christ and goes to hell, God is putting him in hell for something that the man couldn't even help. In Matthew 12, 36, it says, But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. So they're given, if Calvinism is true, they're given account for something that they couldn't even help. What kind of God do they have? Romans 14, 11 through 12, For it is written, As I live, saith the Lord, every knee shall bow to me, and every tongue shall confess to God. So then every one of us shall give account of himself to God. So if I'm not one of the elect, as the Calvinists say, and I can't believe on Jesus Christ, I'm going to give account of myself to God and be punished for something that I couldn't even help. Every person who was born again came to their own decision that they would believe the gospel. God has his hand open. The free gift is there. He's drawing all men to him. You either accept the gift or you reject the gift. And although you can't choose to get unsaved after you're born again, you do choose to get saved. After you're saved, you even have free will to do good or bad. You can't choose to get unsaved, but you choose whether you're going to do bad or do good. In 2 Corinthians 5.10 it says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, that everyone may receive the things done in his body, according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. You made a choice to get saved. And you make choices to live right after you're saved. In Joshua 24, 15, it says, And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom you will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, who will serve the Lord? Joshua made the right choice. Not everyone makes the right choice, but you do have a choice. Total depravity the tea and tulip. If you're going to say that man is so totally depraved that he can't get to God and it's that it's not, it's not his responsibility, then you're wrong. It is man's responsibility. God's done his responsibility. He died on the cross for our sins. Now he's offering the free gift of salvation to every man. It's your responsibility to accept it or reject it. God's not going to make you. Now, the next letter in TULIP is U. We've done T, now we're going to do U, and U is unconditional election. First off, your salvation wasn't unconditional. It obviously isn't conditioned on works, because the Bible's clear on that. But it is conditional on whether or not you have believed on Jesus Christ. You're saved on one condition, and that is, will you believe on Jesus Christ? That's it. By grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. We're saved by grace through faith. That one condition but the Calvinists will take you to Ephesians, Ephesians 1, 4, and 5. According as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love, having predestinated us into the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. They will say, see, you're, we are chosen. God chose us before the foundation of the world. But we are, we are chosen. But the thing is, we aren't chosen until we get in Jesus Christ. God chose to save anyone who got in Jesus Christ. If you, of your own free will, choose not to get in, then you're not saved. You don't get in. God's not choosing before the foundation of the world certain people here and damning some people over here. He's choosing 
before the foundation of the world to save anybody who gets in Jesus Christ. You're also not predestinated until you get in Jesus Christ. You're not predestinated. If God has a bus coming to pick you up and said everyone who gets in, his, in this bus is going to heaven, it's up to you whether or not to get on the bus. If you choose not to get on the bus, then you don't go. But the bus is going to heaven, and it was predestinated to go to heaven. You're not going because you chose not to get in that bus that was predestinated to go to heaven. You see what I mean? God sees through his foreknowledge who will be saved and who won't choose to get in Christ. But he doesn't choose for the person. The person chooses of their own free will. 1 Peter 1, 2, elect, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. God didn't choose for you, but he knew the decision you would make. And he wants all men to get saved and made it whosoever will. Romans 9, 33, as it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. Romans 10, 11 through 13, For the scripture saith, Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed, for there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich in all that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. So anyone who gets in Christ is predestinated. But they aren't predestinated until they get in Christ. If they are predestinated before that, then this would also mean that God predestinated people to go to hell because most people don't get saved. And God's just not going to choose for someone to automatically go to hell. That doesn't make sense. Now the next letter is L, and that's going to be for limited atonement. In Ephesians 5.25, it says, Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for it. So Calvinists teach that Jesus Christ only died for the church. He did die for the church, but he actually died for every person who ever lived. Every person's sin has been paid for. The thing is, they're just, most of them are rejecting the payment. In 1 Timothy 2.4, 2, 4 through 6, it says, Who will have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth? For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. So it says, he will, he, Who will have all men to be saved? It's his will that all men get saved. And it says, He gave himself a ransom for all. He's wanting everybody to get saved. He's not damning anybody against their own will. 2 Peter 2, 1, but there, were all, but there were false prophets also among the people, even as there shall be false teachers among you, who privily shall bring in damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that bought them and bring upon themselves swift destruction. God paid for the sins of every person. They're rejecting the payment. Of their own free will. Second Peter 3 9. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So you're telling me it's his will some men go to hell, and in this verse is telling me he's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So who should I believe? You or the Bible? Notice what Paul tells Timothy in chapter 4 and verse 10 of his letter to him. 1 Timothy 4.10 For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men, especially of those that believe. He clearly says that God is the Savior of all men and then even makes a distinction between those who believe and who don't. Jesus died for everybody. He's the Savior. He's the only way for everybody. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. In 1 John 2, 2, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. It ain't for ours only. It's for the sins of everybody. It is so clear in the Bible that God died for every man and every sin. God wants to show mercy to all men. 
Romans 11, 31 through 32. Even so have these also now not believed that through your mercy they also may obtain mercy. For God hath concluded them all in unbelief that he might have mercy upon all. He wants to show mercy to everybody. God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked, according to Ezekiel 33, 11. So why would he create certain men for the purpose of simply having them live out their miserable life and go to hell? Where is mercy in that? But the next letter in Tulip, the I, and this is for irresistible grace. This teaches that God makes someone get saved against their will. Acts 13, 48 says, And when the Gentiles heard this, they were glad and glorified the word of the Lord. And as many as were ordained to eternal life believed. So what they teach is, God, if, if, you, if you're supposed to get saved, if God wants you to get saved, then you're going to get saved whether you want to or not. Whereas they're, they're, they think there may be somebody who would like to get saved, but they can't. They also believe there's somebody who doesn't necessarily want to get saved, but they're going to because they were supposedly ordained to eternal life against their will. But Matthew 23, 37, Jesus said, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, thou that killest the prophets and stonest them which are sent unto thee, how often would I have gathered thy children together, even as a hen gathereth her chickens under her wings, and ye would not. Notice that, and ye would not. They went against what he was wanting them to do. They have a choice. God's will does not always happen. Every time a person sins, actually, his will is violated. God wants you to do right. God wants you to do the right choice every time. All unrighteousness is sin. He doesn't want you to do anything bad. 1 Thessalonians 4, 3 says, For this is the will of God, even your sanctification, that you should abstain from fornication. When you don't live a sanctified life, you're not doing the will of God. You're violating his, the will of God. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. You don't always do that. You, you break God's will all the time. His will is violated when people reject the gospel. In Acts 17.30, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. It goes against God's will any time anyone rejects the gospel. So why, why would you say it's God's will that some men don't accept the gospel? That makes no sense. 2 Timothy 4 through 6, who will have all men to be saved and to come into the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. His will is violated when men go to hell. As we said in 2 Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but as long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish. He didn't want them to go to hell, but that all should come to repentance. John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Also, think about hell. If God chose to automatically damn certain men to hell against their will, wouldn't hell be created for the so-called non-elect? However, Jesus tells us why hell was created. Matthew 25, 41. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Not for humans, not for the non-elect. It didn't say that. Also look at verses that show men resist the Lord. Acts seven fifty one. Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised and heart and ears, ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. They have a choice. They can go against God's will and resist Him. 2 Timothy 3, 8. Now as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. Deuteronomy 8, 20. As the nations which the Lord destroyeth before your face, so shall ye perish, because ye would not be obedient unto the voice of the Lord your God. They have a choice. 2 Chronicles 33, 10. And the Lord spake to Manasseh and to his people, but they would not hearken. They rejected 
Peter would be contrary to the Lord and resist him. Acts 10, 13, and 14. There came a voice to him, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. But Peter said, Not so, Lord. Not so, Lord. Resisting. John 1, 11. He came into his own, and his own received him not. They resisted. Irresistible grace is not true. And next, the last one, Perseverance of the saints. Calvinists are, actually do believe in eternal security, but they also believe that if you are really the elect, then you will endure to the end. And some of them use verses like Matthew 24, 13, but he that shall endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. And this is a verse doctrinally for saints in the tribulation and is not about enduring to the end of one's life. So while they believe in eternal security, and Bible believers also believe in eternal security, you know, we, we believe eternal security, but they end up adding works to the gospel by saying, if you don't do certain works, then you really weren't the elect. This gives the believer no assurance because every Christian is going to fail and get off into sin at some point, whether he admits it or not. And when a preacher says, if you don't do this or this or that, and, or if you don't do this or that, you aren't really saved or you're, you're not the elect. This only produces a bunch of Christians who deep down have no assurance in their salvation. And if they believe this and, and don't doubt their salvation, then they have to be self-righteous to have the idea that they're doing enough works and living a holy enough life to prove that they are accepted by God. But they teach, if you're truly elect, then you are predestinated to endure to the end, meaning you'll stick with the stuff no matter what, if you're really the elect. But as I have proved before in other studies, not every Christian is going to live like a Christian. Eternal security is true, doctrinally, according to the Bible. Even though not every Christian is going to finish well, he still has eternal security. We are predestinated in the Bible to get two things in the Bible. That is, people who are already saved are predestinated to get these two things. Lost people are not predestinated at all. I didn't get predestinated to get these two things until I actually got in Jesus Christ. The two things I'm predestinated to get is adoption and inheritance. Ephesians 1, 5, and having, having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will, I was predestinated to be adopted by Jesus Christ. I'm predestinated to get a new body, Romans 8, 23. And not only they, but ourselves also, which have the first fruits of the Spirit. Even we ourselves grown within ourselves, waiting for the adoption to wit the redemption of our body. I have no hope of that without getting saved first. Romans 8, 29 through 30. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. Ephesians 1, 11. And whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. Both of these things are something a saved person gets and not a lost person. How does it make sense to say that a lost person is predestined to get a new body and get an inheritance in heaven? When predestination comes up in the Bible, it isn't about someone's soul being predestinated to be saved. It's about something a person's going to get after they're saved. Calvinists teach that people are predestined to be saved before they even believe on Jesus Christ. If Calvinism were true, then a lot of Paul's burden and things he did for others would be unnecessary. Romans 9, 2 through 3, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen, according to the flesh. If the Jews were just automatically damned, then why did Paul say he could wish himself a curse from Christ for them to be saved? Why did he say that? Why did he say in 1 Corinthians 9, 22, To the weak became I as weak, that I might gain the weak. I am made out all things to all men, that I might by all means save some. Why would he say that if it was up to God on whether or not they go to heaven or hell? But I hope this has explained to you why Calvinism is unbiblical and why we reject Calvinism completely as Bible believers.